Good afternoon and thank you for the kind introduction. Today I'm going to provide an overview of post-marketing drug safety regulations and reporting requirements. Hopefully the upcoming slides will be helpful in practice and can be referenced as needed. I'm going to begin the presentation by providing an extensive overview of drug safety milestones in U.S. history. We'll also discuss the submission of safety data to FDA and why it's important to do so in a timely manner. Have any of you ever paused to think about how different people lived just 100 or 150 years ago? My children are baffled by the fact that cell phones and Wi-Fi didn't exist when I was their age. But back in the late 1800s and the early 1900s, indoor plumbing was rare. And without electricity, most homes were heated with old wood-burning stoves and lit with kerosene lamps. And what would you do if you were sick? What would the doctor treat you with? Some medicines were fanciful potions, while some therapeutic drugs were already starting to be developed. But how did we get to where we are today in the world of drug safety and pharmacovigilance? Regulation of human drugs was first brought under federal law in 1906 when the Pure Food and Drug Act was signed by President Theodore Roosevelt. This law prohibited the sale of adulterated and misbranded drugs, but the act did not require that drugs be approved before being marketed or sold. And did you know that FDA did not even exist at this point? Instead, the Pure Food and Drug Act was enforced by the Bureau of Chemistry in the Department of Agriculture. The Bureau eventually became FDA, but not for about 25 years later. In 1937, elixir of sulfonilamide sadly killed more than 100 people, including many children. It is determined that this elixir contained a clear, colorless, poisonous, yet sweet solvent diethylene glycol. The next year, Congress passed the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act of 1938, which required new drugs to prove safety before being marketed. For the first time, new drug applications were required to be submitted to FDA for review of safety information. Then in 1951, Congress passed another law with significant impact on drug regulation the Durham-Humphrey Amendment, which explicitly clarified the vague line between prescription and non-prescription drugs by creating two categories, legend, or prescription drugs, and over-the-counter, or non-prescription drugs. Then, in the early 1960s, FDA received a new drug application for thalidomide. It was expected to be a slam dunk and be approved in the United States because it was being used by pregnant females all around the world. Thousands of women took thalidomide, which was a sedative and a treatment for morning sickness, and babies were being born with birth defects. But thankfully, Dr. Francis Kelsey, a medical officer at the time, took notice and despite pressure from the drug company, FDA refused to approve thalidomide due to inadequate safety data. Dr. Francis Kelsey later received the President's Distinguished Federal Civilian Service Award, the highest civilian honor available to government employees back in 1962. And more importantly, in 1962, President John F. Kennedy further tightened the regulatory process for approval of new drugs with passage of the Keith Alver Harris Drug Amendment which assured not only the safety, but also the effectiveness of drugs for their intended use prior to marketing them. The Kefauver Harris Amendment also required adverse drug reactions to be reported to FDA by drug companies. Next, we'll talk about more recent notable drug laws. The Dietary Supplement and Non-Prescription Drug Consumer Protection Act was signed into law by President George W. Bush on December 22, 2006, also referred to as Section 760 of the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. This law requires a manufacturer, a packer, 
or a distributor whose name appears on the label of an over-the-counter drug marketed in the United States without an approved application to submit serious adverse event reports when used in the United States. The Food and Drug Administration Amendments Act of 2007, or FIDA, was signed into law by President George W. Bush and not only reauthorized the Prescription Drug User Fee Act, or PDUFA, but it also expanded the programs as well. Additional FDA resources were granted to conduct complex and comprehensive reviews necessary, and post-marketing safety activities were now required in the review of drug applications. FDA was authorized to require post-approval studies or clinical trials of a drug to assess risks, and furthermore, the agency could require risk evaluation and mitigation strategies, or REMS, and order labeling changes to address new safety information. And more recently, in 2012, the Food and Drug Administration Safety an Innovation Act, or FDASIA, which is the fifth authorization of the Prescription Drug User Fee Act, also established user fee programs for generic drugs and biosimilars. And finally, earlier this year, President Trump signed the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, or the CARES Act, to not only aid response efforts and ease the economic impact of COVID-19, but also reform and modernize the way OTC monograph drugs are regulated in the United States. The CARES Act establishes an OTC monograph user fee program under which FDA will assess and collect fees from submitters of OTC monograph order requests, as well as facility fees from certain manufacturers of OTC monograph drugs to support the agency's OTC monograph drug activities. Now let's take a minute for a challenge question. What drug was prescribed to pregnant women in the early 1960s, was found to cause fetal abnormalities, and led to legislation requiring drug manufacturers to prove scientifically that a medication was not only safe, but also effective? A. Dextroamphetamine B. Diazepam C. Thalidomide or D, sulfonilamide. Okay, thank you for all those who took the time to answer. The correct answer is C, thalidomide. We just discussed several acts or amendments to acts, and you may have heard the terms act, regulation, and guidance throughout your training or your jobs, and wonder if there's a difference, or if we can use these words interchangeably. Statutes are acts which are legally enacted by Congress and upheld by regulatory authorities. Similar to statutes, regulations are also legally binding and have the full force and effect of law. Regulations are sometimes referred to as rules and describe what is generally considered the proper course of conduct and how provisions of an act are to be applied. Guidance documents, however, do not typically establish legally enforceable requirements. In fact, most guidance documents describe current thinking or interpretation of a specific topic or regulation. Next, we'll discuss post-marketing drug safety regulations. Title 21 is the portion of the Code of Federal Regulations, or CFR, that governs drugs within the United States for agencies such as the Food and Drug Administration and the Drug Enforcement Agency. We'll briefly talk about each of these regulations, but I wanted to include this slide as a useful resource to refer to as needed. Refer to 21 CFR 314.80 for post-marketing reporting of adverse experiences associated with both prescription and non-prescription drugs approved under a new drug application. 21 CFR 310.305 describes regulations of records and reports concerning adverse drug experiences of marketed prescription drugs for human use without approved drug applications. 
refer to 21 CFR 314.98 for post-marketing reporting of adverse experiences associated with drugs approved under an abbreviated new drug application. 21 CFR 329.100 describes electronic reporting of serious adverse events for OTC monograph drugs under Section 760 of the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. 21 CFR 600.80 is very similar to 314.80, but the regulation for post-marketing reporting of adverse experiences associated with approved biologic license applications, or BLAs. And 21 CFR Part 4, Subpart B, identifies post-marketing safety reporting requirements for combination product applicants and constituent part applicants. For your reference, here's a list of some of the guidance documents that we frequently reference regarding adverse event reporting. There's many more than what's listed on the slide and they are all publicly available on FDA's website. As stated earlier, guidances do represent the current thinking of FDA on the respective topics. Now let's discuss the first type of post-marketing safety report shown in this slide, the Individual Case Safety Report, or ICSR. The regulations define an ICSR as a description of an adverse drug experience related to an individual patient or subject. An ICSR is made up of data elements. Adverse drug experiences are reportable to FDA when a firm can identify at minimum a patient, a suspect drug, an adverse event, and identifiable reporter. An exception is human drug outsourcing facilities, which should actively seek to obtain each of these four data elements. But reports should be submitted to FDA as long as the outsourcing facility has information on at least the suspect drug in the adverse event. Information described by data elements should be included in the ICSR submission if available and applicable to the report. To have an identifiable patient, there must be enough information to indicate the existence of a specific patient or consumer. One or more of the following will qualify a patient as identifiable an age, including an age category, such as an adult or adolescent, a gender, initials, date of birth, name, or patient identification number. Patients should not be identified by name or address when reporting to the FDA. Instead, the responsible person should assign a code, such as patient initials or date of birth, to each individual case safety report. In addition, there must be a suspect drug or biologic product. An active ingredient should be reported, and the ICSR should also describe the known product attributes such as dosage form, an NDC, and a strength. Next, reports should not be submitted stating that a patient experienced an injury without further details as this is not specific enough. For reporting purposes, an adverse event should, at a minimum, be described in terms of signs, including abnormal laboratory findings, symptoms, or a disease diagnosis for purposes of reporting. If the reporter does not provide any signs, symptoms, or diagnosis, the firm should obtain more information from the person reporting the adverse event, the patient, or with the patient's permission, the medical professionals who treated the patient. And lastly, identifiable reporters may be of any background. They may be consumers or pharmacists, physicians, other healthcare providers, lawyers, or even family members. There should be sufficient information to indicate that there is an identifiable person who has knowledge about the patient, the adverse event, in a drug involved. Firms should assume that any adverse experience report or fatal outcome are required to be reported to FDA, but for reports derived from clinical studies, 
firms must conclude that there's a reasonable possibility that the drug caused the adverse drug experience. Finally, firms receiving adverse event information should promptly attempt to obtain any missing information. Now let's briefly discuss serious reports. The regulations define a serious adverse drug experience as any adverse drug experience occurring at any dose that results in any of the following outcomes. Death, a life-threatening adverse drug experience, an inpatient hospitalization or prolongation of an existing hospitalization, a persistent or significant disability or incapacity, or a congenital anomaly or birth defect. The regulation goes on to say that important medical events may be considered serious adverse drug experiences when, based upon appropriate medical judgment, they may require medical or surgical intervention to prevent one of the outcomes listed in this definition. So for instance, a patient takes a medication and reports to the hospital emergency department with symptoms of rash, difficulty breathing, tongue, and throat swelling. While in the emergency department, the patient is treated for an anaphylactic reaction with epinephrine and supplemental oxygen and sent home a few hours later after resolution of symptoms. This is probably considered serious. However, if a patient reports to the emergency department complaining of itching after taking a medication, but subsides shortly after taking an antihistamine, this would not be considered serious. We just discussed what four elements are required to submit an adverse event to FDA. And we also touched on what makes an adverse drug experience serious. Now let's talk briefly about what makes an adverse experience expected or unexpected. The current FDA approved labeling for the human drug or biologic product should be used as the reference document to determine whether an adverse experience is expected or unexpected. An adverse experience should be considered unexpected if it is not included in the product's current FDA approved labeling and expected if it is included in the document. ADEs are reported to FDA as individual case safety reports and are either expedited 15-day alert reports or non-expedited periodic ICSRs. The evaluation of seriousness, expectedness, and relatedness for adverse events obtained from a post-marketing study determine if an adverse drug experience should be submitted as expedited or non-expedited. If expedited, the ICSR should be submitted to FDA's Adverse Event Reporting System, or FAERS, as soon as possible, but no later than 15 calendar days from initial receipt of information and periodic ICSR should be submitted on or before the periodic safety report due date. But wait, to every rule, there is an exception, right? Non-expedited or periodic ICSR reporting does not apply to reports from literature, post-marketing studies, or form marketing experience. Additionally, periodic reporting does not apply to unapproved prescription drugs or OTC monograph drugs. Speaking of exceptions, let's next briefly discuss OTC monograph drugs. All serious domestic adverse drug experiences are to be submitted to FDA by manufacturers, packers, or distributors whose name appears on the label of an OTC drug marketed in the United States without an approved application within 15 business days, not calendar days, of receipt of information regardless of expectedness. Non-serious adverse events do not need to be submitted to FDA. Next, I would like to highlight that all post-marketing ICSRs must be reported in an electronic format that FDA can process, review, and archive. This is important so the agency can collect and analyze the post-marketing safety reports. 
And let's pause for another challenge question. Which of the following outcomes does not meet the regulatory definition of a serious adverse drug experience? A, life-threatening. B, a birth defect or congenital anomaly. C, emergency department visit requiring intensive treatment. D, death. Or E, emergency department visit not requiring intensive medical intervention. Great, the answer is E, emergency department visit not requiring intensive medical intervention. In addition to individual case safety reports, firms that hold NDAs, ANDAs, and BLAs must also submit annual reports and periodic safety reports. Please note that these are two different types of submissions and applications or license holders are required to submit both. However, for the purpose of this presentation, we will not discuss annual reports and will only discuss the periodic safety reports. As we just covered, periodic safety reports or PSRs are required to be submitted for approved NDA ANDA and BLA products. Even if the product is not being marketed, firms must submit these reports per required timelines. These reports are required to be submitted quarterly for the first three years after approval and then annually thereafter. The Periodic Adverse Drug Experience Report, or PADER, and the Periodic Adverse Experience Report, or PAYER, are the formats described in the drug and biologic product regulations. However, companies may also submit a waiver request to submit the International Council for Harmonization, or ICH, alternative reporting formats, either the Periodic Safety Update Report, or PSUR, or the more recent Periodic Benefit Risk Evaluation Report, or PBR. The ICH guideline E2C waivers are specific to an application and even if the application transfers from one firm to another firm, the waiver stays with the application and also transfers. Periodic safety reports are comprised of both a descriptive portion and a non-expedited ICSRs received during the reporting interval. Companies should use the Electronic Common Technical Document or ECTD specifications to submit the descriptive portion electronically, whereas the non-expedited ICSRs must be submitted electronically into the FAERS database in XML format or via the safety reporting portal no later than the due date of the periodic safety report. I would like to provide you with just a few helpful websites. There are a few guidance documents, a link to the Code of Federal Regulations, Title 21, a link to the website for information about FDA's Adverse Event Reporting System, or FAERS, electronic submissions, and finally, a link to the SBIA Ready Conference, which specifically highlighted feature topics in pharmacovigilance and risk management earlier this year. There's also links to the session recordings and slides both. At this point, you've been provided with a lot of regulatory information, and you may be wondering why doing all this is important. In addition to being mandated by laws and regulations, there are a number of reasons why drug industry should submit accurate, timely, and complete adverse drug experience information to FDA. To begin, the agency relies on this information to weigh risk versus benefit of a drug after it's approved. Our colleagues continue to monitor drug safety profiles for trends or new safety signals on an ongoing basis so that we can better protect public health. This includes an assessment to ensure labeling accurately reflects the known safety profile. And if needed, FDA will assess the best way to communicate the new safety information to the general public. 
Therefore, when FDA investigators conduct a post-marketing adverse drug experience inspection, it would be in your best interest to demonstrate your commitment to post-marketing drug safety by abiding by all applicable laws and regulations. To close, I'd like to thank you for your time today. For more information or questions about this presentation, please contact the CEDAR Office of Surveillance and Epidemiology's Regulatory Affairs staff at the above email address. And time permitting, I can now take a few questions. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Commander Sims, for your presentation and overview on these post-market requirements. So we do actually have time for questions, so let's jump right in. So our first question is, are the adverse event reports received by FDA directly from healthcare professionals and patients, are those forwarded to manufacturers, or should the manufacturers routinely monitor fares to detect these cases? Hi, thank you for that question. The FDA does receive reports directly from healthcare professionals and patients through the MedWatch program. And for those who don't know, the MedWatch program is FDA's medical product safety reporting program for healthcare professionals and consumers. The FDA does not forward to the manufacturers reports received through the MedWatch program. As of July 31st of just this year, the FDA or discontinued the MedWatch to Manufacturers program. However, in 2017, I believe it was, the FDA launched the FAIRS public dashboard. And the dashboard is an interactive web-based tool that allows the manufacturers to directly search and to download any of the publicly available information from the FAIRS database, including adverse event or adverse experience reports that are submitted voluntarily to the FDA. The FAIRS public dashboard does not provide case narratives, so any of that information will have to be obtained by submitting a Freedom of Information Act or a FOIA request. And that information is available on the FAIRS public dashboard website. All right, great. Thank you for that explanation. Our next question is about guidances. So are there any guidances to address the inclusion of follow-up information into the narratives of an ICSR? So it's important to highlight that firms have to submit to FDA all the information that's noted in the regulations and within the required timeframes. So therefore, any of the new information that's received about an adverse drug experience that was previously submitted must be submitted to the FAIRS database as a follow-up ICSR. The ICSR should provide a complete picture of the current understanding of an adverse drug experience rather than providing only the changes and or updates to the initial ICSR. And accordingly, Follow-up ICSR should include information about an adverse event that has been previously reported along with any of the new information. Great, thank you. All right, and our next question is, what are the submission timelines for ICSRs of adverse, event, adverse drug experiences that are not submitted in an expedited manner as the 15-day alert ICSRs? All serious expected and non-serious adverse drug experiences must be reported to FDA before the next periodic safety report, or the PSR, is due. An exception to that would be if a firm has obtained a waiver of the requirement to submit an individual case safety report that's determined to be non-serious and in current labeling both. Okay, great. Our next question is, has an example and a question. So, for example, if a case is received that only reports a death, in this 
instance, is it required to be submitted to FDA as a 15-day alert ICSR? Wow, oh, another great question. The short answer is that it depends. As stated in the presentation, death is a serious outcome. So if you determine that the death is an unexpected adverse experience because it's not listed in the approved labeling as an adverse drug experience with the possibility of fatal outcome, then yes, it will be required to be submitted as a 15-day alert ICSR. But if death is the only information known about an adverse event, then additional follow-up information should be actively sought and submitted within the 15 calendar day time frame after obtaining any new information. All right, great, great explanation. All right, and next question. If an applicant has a waiver from the requirement to submit non-serious expected adverse drug experiences, do they need to include the information on their periodic safety report? Yes, as a condition of the waiver, firms are required to continue to include the non-serious reports. Expected adverse drug experiences in each periodic safety report submitted to FDA for the referenced approved application in the section that includes the summary tabulation by um, the body system of all adverse drug experience terms and the counts of occurrences submitted during that reporting period. Okay, great. And as a follow-up, where can people find out more information about safety reporting for combination products? For combination products, Captain Melissa Burns presented at the Ready Pharmacovigilance and Risk Management Conference that SBIA held back in June of 2020. It was a very informative presentation. The recording is available on SBI's web, SBIA's website. And in addition, the FDA has a post-marketing safety reporting for combination products webpage that's available on the FDA.gov website. And there's a lot of useful information to refer to on that website. Not only does it include direct links to regulations and guidance document, but there's also some example scenarios and some technical information that's available on that website as well to refer to. Great, thank you. All right, another question. Are non-serious adverse drug experience ICSRs that are submitted at the time that the pater is submitted, are they all entered into FAERS? So applicants, again, can request a waiver of the requirement to submit the individual case safety reports that are determined to be non-serious and in the current labeling for drugs and certain biological products. And if that waiver is obtained, the adverse drug experience does not need to get entered into the FAERS database. However, firms are still required to submit that information on the adverse events to FDA in the summary tabulation section of the next periodic safety report, or PSR. All right, great. We have another question. So our previous speaker, Lawrence Allen, said that the 15-day alert report must be submitted if foreign or domestic. And, and you had said something about US only. Can you clarify the difference between what he said and you said? Unfortunately, I was not online earlier when Mr. Larry Allen was presenting his question. However, if you email the address that was on our last slide, provide maybe a little bit more detail, and we'll be happy to get back to you on that question. OK, great. Um, and. 
I think with that, actually, we are about complete with the section of the questions and answers as we're going to go ahead and get started with our next presenter. And I'm going to turn it over to Ray so he can introduce our next speaker.